Dr. Mace, we're now live on Facebook. Ross, okay, you thank you very much. You? Okay. Great. Um, hi, everybody. I am Dr. Sundari Mace, Sonoma County's Health Officer, and I have our update on COVID-19 cases as of September 22nd. We now have 7,160 confirmed cases in Sonoma County, up 48 cases in the previous 24 hours. These include 1,692 active cases and 5,348 people have recovered, representing no change in the last 24 hours. We also have a total now of 120 deaths, which represents an increase of six deaths reported in the last 24 hours. We have now completed nearly 165,000 coronavirus tests to date. Along with the terrible news of our increase in six deaths, I just like to take a moment to recognize the impact of COVID. As a nation, we have now surpassed 200,000 deaths due to COVID-19 this week. As bells ring and fields of flags are planted in memory of those that we have lost, it's critical for us to take a moment to reflect on why we're being so careful in sheltering in place. It's because this number is heartbreaking and we don't want it to see it get any higher. Our goal is to offset the dire consequences of COVID-19. I would like you to join me in resolving to work even harder to slow the spread of COVID-19 and ease the suffering of so many in our community and across our country. Again, our hearts go out to all of the family members uh, that have been affected by COVID. Today, I will be sharing a presentation with you today on the roadmap to reopening, but before I do, I have a few short updates. As of this week, we remain in the purple tier or tier one of California's blueprint for a safer economy. The state uses two metrics in assigning our current status in their four tier uh, colored, colored tier system. We're currently actually at 9.8 cases per 100,000 per day. Um, that is the latest update. And our test positivity, positivity now is 4.4%. We need to be below seven cases per day per 100,000 and have a test positivity rate below 8% for two consecutive weeks in order to move into the less restrictive tier, which is the red tier. That's the next less restrictive tier. So although our case positivity, that is our test positivity rate is actually in the orange tier, we're still in the purple tier for the daily cases per 100,000. Today, I did sign an amendment to our health order to align our local order with California's blueprint for a safer economy. This amendment allows local businesses and activities to reopen as soon as possible under the state's new framework. One immediate change per state guidance allows child care cohorts to increase from 12 to 16 individuals in each group. Another change this week for business openings is the state's new requirements for nail salons. Nail salons are now allowed to open indoors in all counties in all tiers effective immediately. I know there continues to be a great deal of concern and interest about the process of re reopening schools, but it's important to remember that opening schools is not determined by a single person, but the community as a whole. It's our ability to slow the spread of the virus enough to move us out of the highly restrictive purple tier and into the red tier that will enable us to open our schools for in-person learning, as long as they're prepared and have plans in place for all the mitigation measures and for any eventual cases or the need for contact tracing. Though we are making encouraging progress, we still have a long way to go. We assure you that we understand the high cost of children and their families of not attending school. And we want them back in person learning as soon as it's healthy for our community to go there. I'm currently reviewing the waivers for school openings and anticipate having an update on these by the end of the week. So now let me uh, take us into the slide presentation uh, to give you some of the data.
just a second while I conclude these. Get the slides up, just one second here, okay. All right, are you able to see my screen right now? I'm gonna put it into the presentation mode. Yeah, we can see it. Thank you, Dr. Okay, and you're seeing it as a presentation mode right now? Correct, okay, yes. Okay, great. Okay, so um, this is a, a shorter presentation of the one that was given to the Board of Supervisors the other day. And it's gonna go over uh, some of our metrics and then some of the data that we've been seeing over the past several weeks. So here is the new uh, blueprint for a safer economy um, uh, frame that's being used by the state. Um, as you can see, there are four tiers here. Tier one, or the purple tier, represents widespread transmission of COVID-19. The red tier, or tier two, represents substantial uh, transmission, a community transmission of COVID. The orange tier, signifies moderate transmission of COVID in the community, and then the yellow minimal. So our goal is really to get into tier four or the minimal tier. The two measures I just discussed um, are the new cases per 100,000 population per day that's calculated on a seven day average with a seven day lag, and the testing percentage positivity that we've always used. That is the total number of positive tests over the total number of tests that are performed. So right now, we are about 9.8 new cases, 100,000 per day. And that's actually really good because we've gone from 15 to 16 new cases, per 100,000 population per day to eight to nine over the past couple of weeks. So we're definitely moving in the right direction like many of the other counties in California and other Bay Area counties as well. Our testing percent positivity is actually at 4.4, which puts us in the orange tier. But because the new cases per 100,000 per day is at 9.8, we will remain in the purple tier. One note, we can't skip tiers. So even if our new cases per 100,000 per day were to go into orange in the next couple of weeks, we would still go into red first before we were allowed to go into orange. So again, looking at these metrics, the new cases per 100,000 population per day, you can see that we were pretty high, especially in early to mid August, but we've seen a pretty good ten, trend downwards of the number of new cases per 100,000 population per day. And if we wanna be under seven, that means that we should have on average less than 35 new cases per day, since our population here in Sonoma County is about 500,000. So we're going in the right direction. And actually this has been updated. We're now at 9.8 new cases per 100,000 population per day as of today. Our seven day testing positivity, seven day average that is, has been really high again in end of July and in August um, through about mid to late August. Since that time, our test positivity rate, uh, our percentage has been decreasing and that's why we're in a pretty good place now at about 4.4%. We have been doing a lot of testing our goal was to be able to test 150, uh, do 150 tests per 100,000 population per day. We're actually at 233.8. And this helps us with our case rate, number of cases per day per 100,000, because we're testing so much more, we actually get some credit for that. And our actual number that's looked at by the state is a little lower. It's multiplied, multiplied by a factor of 0.92 or 94 or so to get us into a lower rate. So we're doing really well and our public health lab is able to do the majority of testing for our county. Our hospitalizations are declining, which is also really good news. Still, they remain above the state benchmark of no more than 20 hospitalized COVID patients per day. But as you can see, we are trending downwards as is uh, much of the rest of the state of California. So we're going the right direction there. We've always been at a low percentage of ICU bed availability. Of course, we can always ramp this up if we needed to get more ICU beds in terms of a, in, in case of a surge, but um, we're still at less than 20% ICU beds being available. This is not a metric that's any longer being used 
by the state of California to measure where we are in terms of reopening the county. I want to go over our skilled nursing and residential care facility outbreaks. Overall, there have been 953 residents and staff um, COVID-19 cases in Sonoma County residential care facilities. 93 of the 562 residents in these facilities that were infected were, had very negative outcome of fatality. That gives us a case fatality ratio of 16.5%, which is extremely high, as you can imagine. These are our most vulnerable people. And I'm happy to say that the number of cases in these facilities, both the skilled nursing facilities and the residential care facilities has dropped off and has, has decreased substantially in the past two to four weeks, especially in the last two weeks. Again, looking at this, we've had um, the total of 953 cases of which 562 were residents and 391 were staff. And as you can see, we've um, had uh, about two thirds of our cases occurring in the uh, skilled nursing facilities and uh, one third of the cases occurring in the assisted senior living or board and care facilities um, for uh, a total again of 953 total cases. Over time, as you can see, uh, the dark bar are cases occurring in residents and the light gray in staff. We kind of peaked in the beginning of August in terms of our cases, uh, but we've seen a major decrease in the last two weeks. And as you know, the state of California was here. We called on them to come and help us out in early August when we saw a big increase in these cases. And they've been providing a lot of recommendations and guidance in terms of infection control along with the county. And these recommendations have been implemented across the board in these facilities that are having these outbreaks and even in facilities that are preparing that don't have outbreaks. So that may explain a reason why we're seeing such a decreased number of cases. So our intervention has actually been quite effective. And if you look at the skilled nursing facilities, which are patient care facilities versus the residential care facilities that are board and care homes, um, they both have very vulnerable populations in them. Um, you can see by facility type, we've had a lot of cases early on in the skilled nursing facilities, but then in the beginning of August, mid-August, we saw a lot of cases in the board and care facilities and now, again, those are declining. And that's very good news for the county. So to date, the state's healthcare acquired infection rapid response team, which is a team that came out to provide site visits and give recommendations for infection control and other practices in these facilities, they completed on-site visits at seven skilled nursing facilities and three assisted living facilities that were having outbreaks in the county. They were able to educate healthcare personnel on best practices for bedside care infection control, and also to establish better practices or best uh, practices for facility-wide measures to protect both residents and staff. And again, that's been very effective. They've also provided, we provided two webinars for the long-term care community with current tre trends, up-to-date information for mitigating COVID-19. And these strategies have been very effective, as you can see from the decline in cases. We have also put out a lot of public health guidance to facilities over the entire time of the pandemic. In March, the county issued an order to long-term care facilities requiring them to have plans in case of COVID and to have infection control measures in place. We also restricted visitation at that time of, um, for residents to try to prevent COVID from getting into these facilities. In April, we issued an order requiring screening of staff entering congregate care and living facilities for, um, to screen them for both COVID symptoms and for a temperature check. And we also instructed or mandated that all persons in the facility wear facial coverings. Masks, surgical level masks in skilled nursing facilities, and at least a facial covering in the residential care facilities for the elderly. This order also discouraged staff from working at more than one facility and mandated that if staff did move from one facility to another, that they were required 
um, a change of clothes and a shower between shifts at different facilities. And this order also prohibited at the time communal dining and group activities, trying to limit the potential for person-to-person -person interaction and a possible spread of COVID-19 in the facilities. In August, we released guidance on cohorting in skilled nursing facilities uh, so that skilled nursing facilities could best place individuals together. Um, in other words, all positive, COVID positive people together, all COVID negative people separately in a complete separate wing together. And then those people who are either pending tests or uh, contacts to cases and awaiting their quarantine period to end to be cohorted together in what we call the yellow zone. So red zone would be for people who are positive for COVID, the green zone for those negative and the yellow for those who are awaiting their status. And I think that was very effective. We also gave guidance on a hospital discharge to skilled nursing facilities and transfer to hospital from skilled nursing facilities in case people needed to go to the acute care facilities. In September, we uh, decided to um, address the issue of isolation, depression, and anxiety in our older adults that are in these facilities because of the lack of the ability to socialize with others in a safe way. So we did uh, talk with the Department of Social Services, ombudsperson, person and others, and we lifted the prohibition on communal dining, but gave very specific um, recommendations and guidance on what kind of mitigation measures should be in place if people were to um, eat together and if visitation is to be happening um, again. So um, we have lifted the prohibition and stated that certain numbers of people can eat together with social distancing and physical distancing. And we are now, again, as I just said, loosening, considering and moving towards loosening the restriction on visitation, and we'll be issuing guidance for outdoor visita visitation with families. So moving now to occupational trends, we have seen elevated case numbers in these areas, agriculture, construction, healthcare, retirees, sales and service, unemployed, and, and the unknown group. The areas that have higher contact rates are agriculture, healthcare, and sales and service. So here is our list of different uh, cases by profession. We have, as you know, had a disproportionate number of COVID-19 cases in the Latinx community as compared to non-Latinx cases. Um, and this, luckily, this number has been going down. And um, it was about 77% at one point now we're down to 54% because we've done a lot of pop-up testing in this group to try to find people who are cases, get them isolated, get their contacts quarantined and tested. We've also performed a lot of outreach in terms of media messaging and uh, giving information through Spanish uh, radio stations and through our town halls and through the Facebook live stream as we're doing right now. And that has had an impact in decreasing the percentage of cases in the Latinx. But we've also seen an increase in the cases amongst other ethnic groups. And that's due to the fact that we are opening the county and we are seeing a lot of other people other than just essential workers who are out and about and um, are then more at risk for COVID as a result. So this disparity has decreased, but we still have probably a six fold case rate increase in the Latinx that we're still working very hard on. As compared to non-Latinx cases, Latinx cases are younger because they're mainly the essential workers that are working, more often due to close contact transmission because this transmission is happening in households and work sites, more often show no symptoms because they are younger and um, there are contacts and we're testing all contacts, asymptomatic and symptomatic, and they're less likely to have an underlying condition and be hospitalized because they're younger. It's really the older people over age 50 that are more likely to have an underlying condition or to be hospitalized. We've had a total of 88 unique vineyard, winery, uh, and ranches that were noted as places of work uh, for our cases. In, and of, of note, about 30% did not mention a place of work. We've had 12 clusters with five or more positive cases, um, with the average number being about uh, 11 and the median number 7.5 but the range five to 38 confirmed cases. 
amongst our clusters. 107 of these persons noted workplace as a confirmed or likely place of exposure. And uh, the analysis did not include wineries or tasting room customers um, uh, who noted uh, the winery as a place of exposure, but we have had cases in wineries and, and tasting rooms. As you can see over time, um, the agriculture uh, case timeline, you can see we've had a lot of cases in mid-August, but again, they're declining over time, majority occurring in close contacts and due to community transmission. And our cases looking at kids over time, we've had a lot of cases in kids. That's one of the main takeaways. And we've, they're mainly uh, household members and um, contacts to family and household. And we've had uh, uh, a lot, majority due to our contact investigation, as I said, in households over time. But again, these numbers of cases seem to be decreasing as well. As I've pre presented before, we've had school and child care outbreaks. We've had 15 schools and child care facilities with known cases. Three clusters of at least five cases or greater. One cluster of 30 plus cases that's ongoing. A total of 66 cases, 27 students, 10 staff, 29 parents and siblings amongst these cases. And the locations of our cases are all around uh, Sonoma County, not occurring in any particular um, area of the county and exposures occurred on site. As you can see, we've had six early care and learning centers, three elementary schools, six family child care homes. And you can see the breakdown of students, staff and family members. The first cluster uh, was an early care and learning center and is, it's ongoing, 30 cases as of September 15, 16 students with the student being the first or index case, three staff members, 11 parents and siblings. The outbreak is still ongoing with at least 11 contacts pending. And uh, the facility closed for a two week period. Um, I, just a second, I have to get the light to go on again so you can see something. Uh, the facility did close for a two week period. Uh, cluster two are family child care homes in Central County, uh, one particular home, nine cases, two students, one staff, six parents or siblings. And uh, the quarantine period is completed and the cases are closed at this time. A third cluster, again, a family child care home. So these are all in-person um, learning experiences. 10 cases, three students, one staff, six parents and siblings in the facility closed August 14th. And now the cases are closed and quarantine complete. In addition to these clusters, there's 12 other facilities that have less than five cases um, reporting possible exposure on the campus. There's an additional nine facilities, either elementary, middle or high schools that have been mentioned in case investigation. And again, they're occurring throughout the county. These schools are currently remote. They're not in person, but there are a total of 18 students, two staff and 16 family members with confirmed cases. And uh, the reason, again, to look at this data and present it is to note that there is a potential uh, for exposures if schools were to open for in-person learning. And that's just a risk that we take. And then we'll see um, very, we have very uh, systematic protocols for when schools uh, should perform contact investigation and uh, make sure that more testing occurs, um, do surveillance testing, and when schools may need to reclose again once they open for in-person learning if there were an outbreak. 381 cases, zero to 17, are still under investigation, and they potentially could be school-related, but we have not identified that yet. We're still working on, uh, by the EPI team, is still working on that analysis. So uh, in preparation for influenza season, uh, the county is gonna reissue a health order for influenza, encourage, and this is very important for this Facebook live stream, encourage the public to get the flu shot. Um, that is so important and there's so many different ways you can get a flu shot through your doctor, through health uh, clinics. We will be providing increased accessibility through the Sinead drive-through. Um, and let me just go back to influenza to say that it's really, really important. We have a vaccine for one um, illness uh, while we wait for a potential vaccine for the other, which is COVID. So I think we should do our best as a community to minimize the risk of influenza this season. So everybody, um, the influenza vaccine is available. We'll have uh, some drive-through uh, clinics that we'll be announcing at Sinead and all of the health centers 
and Kaiser, other facilities are offering the flu vaccine. So please do take advantage of that and get your flu shot either this month or in October. So thanks very much. I'll stop that and uh, we can move on to questions at this time. Great. Um, thank you, Dr. Mace. Um, and uh, so this time we'll move on to questions, but before we do, um, um, I, I, I want to remind everybody that you are welcome, uh, the members of our public uh, are viewing us on Facebook Live and YouTube Live. Um, you're welcome to submit questions either by leaving uh, a question in the comment section or by emailing us at publicaffairs at sonoma-.org. That's publicaffairs at sonoma Dash County .org. Um, Jose, have uh, you want to do a little a reminder for our Spanish speaking audience? Thank you. Sí, hola, yo soy José Lana Verde del Condado de Sonoma. Está bienvenido a esta sesión. Esta reunión es una actualización sobre COVID-19 con la doctora Sundari Mays. La presentación es en inglés y cuenta con interpretación en español. Para escuchar en español por Zoom, vaya a parte de abajo en la pantalla a la derecha, donde verá el signo del globo, identificado como interpretación, y oprime para seleccionar español. También puede escuchar esta reunión en español a través de YouTube en el canal de Condado de Sonoma. El enlace está en la página del Condado de Sonoma en Facebook. Gracias. Back to you, Paul. Okay, thank you, Jose. Uh, Dr. Mace, our first question comes from Nicole, who asks, um, um, we are seeing counties all around us move into the red tier. I think uh, Sonoma County and Contra Costa County are the only counties um, in the Bay Area that are still in the red tier. She asks, uh, while this is, why is our numbers, why are numbers in Sonoma County going up? That's not the case. We've actually seen them going down, but um, uh, maybe you could explain why our numbers are different than the rest of the Bay Area. Well, um, I, I know, Paul, as you just noted, our numbers are actually going down. For the past two weeks, as I just presented, we've gone from a uh, case rate of 15 to 16 new cases per day per 100,000 down to eight to nine, which is um, uh, really a great uh, event. I think that we are moving that direction. And our test positivity, which was hovering somewhere around 6.7, is now down to 4.4. Those are all good things. We are actually, as I presented a couple of weeks ago, quite different from some our neighboring Bay Area counties. We're probably more like another coastal county, which is Monterey County, in that we are a home to tourism, agriculture, and industry. And uh, tourism is a big one um, that uh, we share with our beaches, with the Russian River, uh, that sort of thing. So that may explain some of the difference, but also we have a huge agricultural farm worker, um, vineyards, wineries, all those things. Uh, central workers in Sonoma County also live and work within our border. And so they're counted uh, when there are cases in our uh, county. Uh, in, and I think the other thing to note is that we're doing a lot of testing, which is really good for our county. We're testing all of our contacts, asymptomatic or symptomatic. And we've provided a lot of pop-up testing for our vulnerable populations, the Latinx, as well as our congregate settings and though that's really good because we're finding all of our cases and getting them isolated and quarantined, it also increases our numbers. Thank you. I, I encourage our, our viewers to go back and see the uh, uh, presentation you gave on Friday, uh, September 11th, where you went into more detail as to showing how our comparison with uh, another agriculture and tourist destination county, Monterey County, um, how that's a very similar comparison. Um, Okay, the next one comes from Bruce, who asks, uh, what is this, we, we had the notification about um, nail salons opening yesterday, the governor allowed those even for those of us in the purple tier, what is the status of gyms being permitted to open indoors? Yeah, that's actually not part of the purple tier for the governor's reopening. Um, I want to say that's going to be closer to orange or so. But we'll, you can take a look at the website and you'll see exactly what's allowed to open under what tier. Yeah, I, I, I believe 25% um, uh, capacity in the red tier, but I, okay. um, we'll double check. Yeah, that. so we'll double check on that and uh, we can post that as well. Yeah, okay. Uh, the next question is, um, we have a 
uh, from Shailene. She asks, we have a spa location in Sonoma County and learned that Governor, Governor Newsom approved nail services to move indoors, even in counties still in purple. Has Sonoma County officially, has Sonoma County officially approved this, the opening of nail salons? Yeah, the amendment to the health order that was signed today allows us to simply align with the governor's um, tier opening without having to revise our order at all. So uh, yes, we are totally on board with changes as we move from tier to tier and as the governor approves. All right. Um, now we'll turn to our, our media partners. We have a question for Martin Espinoza, the press Democrat. Martin. Hi there. Hi, Dr. Mace. Hi, Paul. So Nicole actually stole my question. Um, I was going to ask about the, the Bay Area counties and and how we're one of two. Uh, I spoke to Contra Costa County this afternoon, and uh, they just made this pat yesterday. The uh, they got below the or the metrics for the red red tier. Um, they're under the impression though that because of the lag, they will only have to wait one week that they could actually get into the red on Tuesday. Is that does that make sense? You mean next Tuesday or this Tuesday? This coming Tuesday. Yeah, I don't know. I mean, I that's not, I think, what uh, the state's uh, blueprint puts out, but um, I, you'd have to ask Contra Costa. Mm -hmm. But, um, and I think in the past regarding what makes us different from, from uh, other Bay Area counties, you had said that uh, those, that other counties south of us in the Bay Area um, experienced this wave sooner than we did. Yes, yes, that's a, that's a good point, Martin. And I was going to state that when, um, with this question that um, they had a rise in cases about, I'd say a good month before us. Um, and so we are probably following behind. In other words, we're seeing our decrease in cases and um, maybe we're a couple weeks behind them in that as well. So uh, I think we're hopefully going to continue to see this decrease in cases. However, let me just say that we don't know yet what the impact of the evacuation due to the fires, which was unforeseen, might have had on our case numbers. So um, it's been about three weeks. So I'm still thinking we could see a blip in cases from that. We also don't know that we're seeing the impact of Labor Day since it's only been a couple of weeks. So we will still wait to see what those, uh, how that has all impacted our case numbers. Just lastly, uh, this this slide that shows 88 unique winery, uh, vineyard wineries and ranches. Um, can you mention what some of the largest ones were? That that, that seems like a very large number of of, uh, of businesses. Yeah, actually, uh, at this time, I don't know. Uh, I can't, you know, single out any specific wineries. Um, but I mean, I, I, we are thinking uh, possibly of giving some more detailed information. Um, but as we hit higher and higher numbers, it makes it easier to do so. But at this time, we're not really releasing names for public health. And, and just real quickly, th almost 30% of participants did not mention place of work. Do they just not want to say where they work or? or, or what yeah, I don't, I think there's a, a still, you know, a lot of fear associated with being identified. And so I think a lot of people uh, refuse to answer those questions. It would be helpful to get that information, but that's probably what's driving it. Are the bosses telling them not to say where they work or, or what is that? I, I don't know. I just know that they answered uh, that they wouldn't give that information. Okay, thank you. Uh, Dr. Mesa, is, um, uh, we're asking for one clarification. You noted that on those two key metrics that uh, really drive us, we'll determine whether we'll move into that red tier um, we are down to, uh, I think you said 4.6% in terms of um, um, the testing uh, positivity rate, which actually is more in the orange tier, as I recall. Um, uh, but then the, um, the other rate is the, um, uh, you had noted we dropped from 15.6 at some point to 8.6 in the uh, cases per 100,000. But we, we actually get credit for 8.3. What is that that extra point, point 0.3 we get uh, credit for? It, is, is that? Yeah, so, so actually, um, our, as of today, the test positivity uh, percentage is 4.4%. And the newest case rate 
4.4 cases per day uh, per 100,000. But let me just clarify that we're doing a lot of testing. So we get a, um, our case rate is multiplied by a factor less than one to adjust it downwards because we're testing so much more. And you can just go onto that California Department of Public Health website and you'll see exactly what the factor is. So um, if we are testing 238, or doing 238 tests per day per 100,000, our case rate gets multiplied by 0. 0.92 or 94. If say, for example, we were under our testing target, instead of testing 150, doing 150 tests per day per 100,000, we were doing 100, say, then we'd have to actually multiply our case rate by one point something and would increase our case rate. So it's a way of sort of adjusting for the fact that we're testing more. Great, thank you for clarifying. So we're, we're getting closer, it seems, every day. Um, uh, let's turn again to uh, uh, our media friends, uh, Carrie Benefield. Carrie, you have a question? Yeah, hi, Dr. Mace. Um, hi, Paul. So we've got, uh, in our high school community, we've got teams and kids who are starting to or continuing to work out and they're working out in groups and they're with coaches and they're, um, as far as I can tell, you know, following guidance. What exactly is allowed? Um, are our kids to be in gymnasiums six feet apart? Are they to be outside? Are they to be wearing masks all the time? Like what, people are trying to figure out what to do and, and what, what are the answers for these kids that are working out? Yeah, uh, the guidance on uh, activities, group activities for kids and cohorts is on the CDPH website. At this time, no indoor such activities are allowed in the purple tier or tier one. And there's very specific mitigation measures that need to be followed. And um, in terms of social physical distancing, the numbers of uh, kids that can be together, I think it's somewhere around, um, I want to say 16, but I'll need to check on that. We do have one of our epidemiologists on the line, that's Kate Peck. I don't know, Kate, if you have any further specific information about group activities for kids. Otherwise, we can get back to you on that, Carrie, but it's on the CDPH website and that's what we're following. Okay, and I mean, is in this, this may fall under the get back to me question, but do you know what rules change? Should we go into the red tier, like um, any really notable changes um, at that point? Yeah, I think the main one really in terms of schools is just the ability to, to with mitigation measures, move towards in-person um, learning in all schools, not just K through six through waiver, but all schools um, together. And we can look at that on the website and let you know further what specifics, if there's anything in terms of activities for kids. Okay, and then let me, I'm sorry, one more follow-up is, is can you give me your, your take on this. I mean, because there are there are groups practicing, there are groups doing workouts, there are groups getting together, um, and you know, for all of the positives that they say they're getting out of it, and just giving kids a place to go and a place to sweat and, and be with their peers, is this a good idea? I mean, are there positives here if they're following the rules that are laid out in the in the public health um, list? I mean, what it, what is your take on kind of return to sweat and sport? Well, there's always going to be a risk when you have um, kids that are together and, you know, they're going to try their best, I'm sure, to physical and uh, social distance and facial coverings. But when you're exercising, especially, that's also hard. And so there will be risks. And as you can see, um, the data that we presented on cases that are already we're already seeing in these early child care uh, learning in the facilities, as well as the family uh, care homes, suggest that we will be seeing cases as we open up and do more things like these uh, in-person construction and activities. That's just a trade-off that will exist. And we have to be prepared then to do contact investigation, find the cases, isolate cases and quarantine contacts, test all the contacts. That's what we need to be prepared for. Okay, thanks so much. Okay, um, on the issue of schools, um, Danielle asks, um, uh, on the issue of waivers, which you started uh, reviewing as I uh, late last week, how long does it take to review a single waiver and how many waivers do you have? Um, and how many waivers are you going through each day? How is that, you know, you got a few questions there. Yeah, I think there's about 14 waivers to date and we might be getting more in. And um, yeah, it takes uh, a while, 
there's no specific time. It depends on the, the length of the actual application, but um, I've been able to get through a couple of waivers a day, and then we're going to discuss it with our um, uh, superintendent of schools as well, and hopefully come to some decision um, on the waivers as quickly as we can. Great. Um, and uh, here's another question from our Facebook audience. Is, is they're asking, is the decrease decrease uh, in our numbers, could that be a result of the fires and the fact that nobody's going outside because of the bad air? Well, say that again one more time, sorry. They're, they're asking whether the, the, the you note that our numbers have been going down and they're asking whether that's maybe a result of the fires and because nobody's going outside because of the bad air. Are people well, that is certainly a good hypothesis too. So um, absolutely, if uh, people are less likely to be out and about and uh, gather, whether it's outdoors or indoors, then I think we may see less cases. Yeah. That's possible. Well, it could cut both ways. I know there's concern that because of the evacuation, some people were congregating more and we may, you know, see some numbers yeah. there too. So. Right. So people may have um, uh, stayed with or been with non-household members like neighbors or extended family and that kind of thing. And that could also increase our cases. So I think we're still waiting to see what the impact is. Yeah. Okay. Um, Kaylee Tornay, you have a question? Yes. Hi. Hi, everyone. Um, my question is about um, this uh, release and the specifically the sentence about that the amended health order also allows in-person student instruction at higher education institutions when the county enters the appropriate tier. So is that a change or is that just sort of reaffirming what is has already been in place heretofore? Um, which document are you referring to now, Kaylee? Um, it is about the amended health order that came out today. Yeah, no, I, that is not, uh, it's just aligning with the state because we were a bit more restrictive in terms of higher education. So what that amendment now does is align us with what the state has put out after we had initially come out with the more restrictive um, uh, order. Can you help me understand what restrictions um, were maybe sort of additionally in place here that, that were now maybe going to be phased out or something or to be in, in line with the state guidance? Yeah, so initially before the state guidance came out, we had said there should be no in-person instruction in, in higher education, uh, given our numbers and our rates. Um, but now what, what we're saying is that, again, as long as the uh, institute, whatever the higher education learning, um, um, whichever school it is, as long as they follow the governor's state guidance for re reopening, which is gives very specific um, criteria on how to open, you know, how, how many people can come back, that kind of thing, as long as they follow that, that we're aligning with that, that's all. Okay, yeah, it happened to coincide with a conversation that I've been having with uh, our local Beauty College, Lytles, and I think that they were kind of holding back on that uh, they've been not doing any in person. And I'm tr basically trying to figure out if this means that maybe they'll be able to, which obviously is a decision they'll make for themselves. But does is this potentially removing a barrier to them bringing students back at this point? From your well, you know, we're in contact. We are in discussion with all of these um, uh, higher education uh, learning facilities, and we. We are talking to them, and if they have a good plan and they're able to um, meet all the standards that and the um, recommendations or order put out by the governor, then yeah, they're good to go. Then. Thank you. Okay, um, here's a, a question from Kathy, uh, uh, who said asks. You have uh, this concerns the um, infection rate in some of our, our senior living uh, uh, communities. She asked, you have said there is no place for the infected seniors in skilled nursing facilities and residential care homes to go so they don't spread COVID to the other residents in those facilities. She asked, why can't they use the hospital beds 
264 hospital beds that are reported each day on the hospital resource availability chart on socoemergency.org. I think that's a question for the hospitals and for the skilled nursing facilities. Um, the patients who are positive are cohorted together in the skilled nursing facilities away from all the other uh, residents. Yeah, you may not want to move them to a new facility to um, risk potential more exposure at that point. Okay. Um, another question from Facebook. Do you have dates um, in mind for when the public health uh, officials will start the drive-through flu shot? And we'll announce those um, well in advance. It will be in October. We're just uh, identifying a couple of weekends that we could do that. And we'll put that information out to everybody and probably do this through appointments as we have for the antibody test and for the PCR-based testing, but we'll get back to you soon about that. Okay, thank you. Martin, you have a question? Um, yeah, this is regarding the uh, press release that was put out today. Um, aside from nail salons, which was you know, addressed head on, as well as uh, uh, cohorting at the daycare, that number increasing, and then also the thing that uh, Kaylee just talked about with regard to higher education, what other tweaks are, are being made to our local health order to bring it in line with the state requirement? Really nothing else. Those are kind of the key things that have been highlighted. Um, other than that, the, the, I guess uh, the sort of uh, the main goal of the amendment is that every time something changes in the governor's order, we would not have to then issue a new order from our standpoint, rather, this amendment just states that we're going to align with it. The other question I had is regarding the uh, the higher education. Do you know what tier we would have to get to to uh, to open up to allow that? Higher education? Yeah, I, we'd have to look that up. We can get back to you on that. But it's not in purple. I don't know. Is it in is it in red? Uh, or is it in some I wouldn't want to tell you the wrong thing this time, Martin. So I think we need to look on the state website and see exactly where higher education um, comes in. And just finally, are we going to make the red uh, metric, the uh, red tier metrics on Tuesday? Well, I guess it, we'll have to wait and see because um, I don't think I can predict just depends on the number of cases we see every day from here to next Monday. Right. We already have a couple of days that we can count. But there is whether we end up in less than 35 a day average or not. My understanding is that the lag would end uh, September, that it would be the week ending September 22nd. Or, I'm not exactly sure how the state uses that. Um, I don't know if our epidemiologist wants to weigh in. I don't know. Kate, you're on. Uh, whether we can already calculate that or not, I'm not sure. Hi, um, so they do use a seven day leg, um, but part of the reason for that is they want the data to be as complete as possible. Um, as we've talked about previously, Martin, I'm around the episode date um, that is used to calculate the case rate that's looking at onset date of infection. Um, that data is refined and gets better every day. So when they actually pull that data, it may look different than if we were to pull data for those dates right now. Um, so we'll have to wait until um, next week to see where we are. Well, I think um, uh, we're gonna we're gonna end it there, and I think that's uh, uh, an option. And hopefully by next week, we may be talking about what the red tier looks like. In the meantime, we will be putting out more information as to what those impacts uh, will mean. Um, for us as a county. And um, just want to remind everybody to, uh, we will be doing these presentation presentations each Wednesday, and we look forward to seeing you back here uh, next week. So take care. Thank you, everybody, for your participation.